we're going to finish off for a little review of our dynamics unit with a, uh, a few minutes, about 10 to 15 minutes on energy. Yesterday we talked about forces and what forces are and what kind of problems that we can see involving forces, those multi-force problems, those are the big ones, right? Uh, inclined planes, pulley problems and so on, those are the big ones. We know we're going to see one of those on the test. We know we're going to see some stuff with energy as well in our written response portion of the test. Um, we know we got two kinds of energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion, right? If something is moving, it's got kinetic energy. So not only uh, do you have to be able to define kinetic energy, the energy of motion, and be able to recognize that in the multiple choice question, but in problems, you've got to be able to recognize when something is moving, it has kinetic energy. When something is not moving, it doesn't have kinetic energy. We've got potential energy as well, which we broke down into well, there's a number of subcategories we can break down potential energy into. Stored energy, okay, we broke it down into two subcategories, uh, specifically gravitational potential energy. And then we talked about spring or elastic potential energy. We talked about that within our simple harmonic motion and waves unit, but we'll take a look at both of those today just because we're not going to go back and review simple harmonic motion waves now. Kinetic energy. The energy of motion can be found by the equation 1 half mv squared. And of course, we know that mass has to be in what units? David, what are the units that mass has to be in there? Right, good. And uh, Stefan, what units does speed have to be in there? Good, meters per second. So if you've got uh, kilometers per hour, whatever, convert it to meters per second and you're good to go. Gravitational potential energy is the energy stored due to an object's height above something. And we can define the gravitational potential energy relative to whatever we want. Usually it's relative to the ground, but every once in a while it might make sense to define it relative to something else. Okay, for instance, let's say uh, I want to find the potential energy of the ball at this height that is... Uh, let's say the potential energy of the ball at this height that's 2.0 meters above the floor, above a table, we don't know how high the table is. Well, here's the floor down here, and usually we define the potential energy of something relative to the floor, but if it's convenient to do it relative to the top of the table, then we can do that. If we do that, however, then we've got to make sure that we define the potential energy relative to the top of the table of everything involved in the question, not just the ball, but if the ball, right now, but if the ball happens to be falling or rising or whatever, make sure you're always defining it relative to the same thing. So gravitational potential energy, define it relative to whatever we want, and its equation is going to be mgh. M is in kilograms, g is 9.81, on Earth that is, h is uh, the height above whatever it is that you want. Uh, spring potential energy, or elastic potential energy, sometimes we call it elastic potential energy, is found by using the equation 1 half kx squared. X being the displacement of the spring or elastic means how much it's stretched or compressed, not how much it's moving across the floor down or moving across town, but rather how much it's compressed or how much it's stretched. K is the spring constant. And the spring constant comes from, uh, sometimes we're given the value of the spring constant, sometimes you got to find it as well using Hooke's law. F is equal to kx, which, if you remember, really is just that definition of simple harmonic motion, right? Motion which the restoring force is proportional to the displacement. So we got three equations for energy that we used in physics 30, sorry, physics 20. Um, but one of those equations, one half kx squared, will often need to find k using f is equal to kx. Okay, although that can go both ways, right? Sometimes you're going to have to find k using the potential energy equation to put it into my, into my um, Hooke's law equation, f is equal to kx. All right. And then we talked about work, and we defined work, we defined work in a couple of ways. Well, we defined it in one way. We defined it as the change in energy experienced by something. So the energy gained or lost. by something. And we know that uh, in order to have a change in energy, an energy gained or lost, there's two things that are required to be done. We got to first push or pull the object. We got to apply a force on the object. And 
and we also need a displacement. We need movement. You can't give an object energy if you just push it. Okay? You push it and it doesn't move, then the energy of the desk or whatever it is that I'm pushing is exactly the same after I push it as before. If there's no change in energy, there's no work done. So not only do we need a force, we need movement as well. Therefore, we can not only define or we can not only have an equation for work as delta E, but we can say that work is equal to F times delta D as well. F being the force, D being the displacement. But this equation, as we have it written right now, assumes that the force and the displacement are parallel to each other. If they're not parallel to each other, then we have to tack on another variable, which is cos theta. Theta being the, the angle, not just any angle, not just a random angle that's given to you in a problem, but specifically it's the angle between the way that it's pushed and the way that it moves. So if I push it, uh, to the right, and it moves at 30 degrees, then the angle is going to be 30 degrees. If I push it at 30 degrees and it moves at 30 degrees, then the angle that we're going to use is going to be zero because we're moving it in the same way as we're pushing it. So don't just write down an angle because you have an angle given to you, but rather use an angle only if it's the angle between the way that it's pushed and the way that it moves. We're talking about power. Power, if you remember, was that that was that uh, shoveling snow, shoveling snow example, right? Where, where I can't remember who we used as our as our snow shovelers, but we had two people. We pretended two people lived beside each other, identical driveways, a foot of snow in each driveway. Each of them shoveled the exact same amount of snow. We said the work done by both people was exactly the same, but the power wasn't because one person was much quicker than the other person. Power is not work, although it's closely related to work. It's the rate at which work is done. And anything that's a rate is going to have time on the bottom. The units for power, by the way, are joules per second or watts, which is a little bit confusing because work is a W watts is a W, and watts aren't units for work. Watts are units for power. A little bit confusing, but it usually ends up working out. Now remember, we've already defined work as the change in energy, so sometimes we may need to say, uh, sometimes we may be given a value for work here, sometimes we may, may need to find work by setting it equal to the change in energy. Or sometimes you need, may need to find work by setting it equal to F times the displacement. So we may need to get work first and then put it in, or we may be given the work or the change in energy, and we just plug it in directly. Biggest thing we did with this, honestly, biggest thing we did here is conservation of energy. Right? We spent time talking about kinetic energy and potential energy and, and work and power and so on, but we spent more time talking about conservation of energy than we did any of these other things. Okay? That's important, conservation of energy. What do we mean by conservation of energy? What we really mean is con conservation of mechanical energy. You guys know that mechanical energy is the sum of kinetic and potential energy. So what we're really saying here is that can mechanical energy, kinetic, and potential energy combined are conserved. We may lose kinetic energy. We may lose potential energy. But combined, the total is going to stay the same. So if we lose kinetic, we're going to gain potential. And if we lose potential, then we're going to gain kinetic. So what kind of problems do we see with conservation of energy? Well, when we looked at this in our dynamics unit, we saw problems that were, uh, lots of them were like this. And maybe a, a roller coaster is moving at a speed of 10 meters per second at the top of the hill, and the height of the hill was 20 meters, and we wanted to know how fast it was moving at the bottom of the hill, or even better, how fast it was moving at, this, at the top of this second hill, which was nine meters, nine meters high. Okay. We solved problems like that. In our last unit, when we talked about superharmonic motion waves, um, we did a lot of problems like this as well, but we extended it to include springs. So maybe we don't just have a problem like this where the, the object is moving at 10 meters per second, but rather 
We get a situation where the little car or whatever it is is on the end of a spring. It has a spring constant of 25 newtons per meter, a displacement of uh, 10 centimeters, and a height of, say, 35 centimeters. Maybe there's a height over here of, of uh, 20 centimeters. How fast is it moving over here? Both of these questions are pretty much the same thing, right? In the first one, and I would, I would really pay attention to what I'm about to do here, okay? Because I said, you're going to see this. You're going to see energy in the written portion of your exam. Okay, you're going to see it in the written portion of the exam. And I just reminded you that we spent quite a lot of time on conservation of energy. Okay? So it's probably a good idea for you to pay really close attention to what I'm about to do here. Okay, both of these problems are pretty much the same problem, except we've got uh, a slightly different kind of energy in one problem versus the other. Let's look at the first one first. In this one, we're going to say EI is equal to EF. Now, in the first one, the initial energy is at the top of the first hill. William, what kind of energy, maybe tell me one kind of energy that I have at the top of the first hill. Good. Um, what kind of potential, by the way? Gravitational or, good, because there's a height, right? There's not gravitational potential because there's not something else. There's gravitational potential energy because of what there is. There is a height there is gravitational potential energy. So we're going to say MGH I. Is there anything else, any other type of energy at the top of this first hill? Taylor? In the first problem there, anything else there besides gravitational potential energy? No? Nick, anything else? There's, it's moving, right? If it's moving, there's kinetic energy. It doesn't matter if there's a height. It doesn't matter if there's a spring. If it's moving, there's kinetic energy. So we're going to add to that 1 half mv squared. Do not, don't multiply those together. Okay, Add them together. Mechanical energy is the sum of kinetic and potential. It's not the product. Okay, Some people like to multiply them for whatever reason. Now, let's look at the second problem over here, or the second part of that problem here. Emma, what kind of energy do I have at the, second, at the top of the second hill? I've got gravitational potential energy because I've got a height. Olivia, do I have kinetic energy in the second part of the problem at the end of it? Over here? Is it moving? I'm trying to find the speed, right? Oh, yeah. okay, if I'm trying to find the speed, it's going to be moving. And if it's moving, I'm going to have kinetic energy. Good. Now, in this problem, I'm able to cancel out the mass. How come? Good, because every term has a mass. We're not looking at it and saying both sides have mass in it. We're looking at it and saying every single term has mass. Now, it's okay if, if there's only one term on one side and two terms on the other. That's okay. If it's in every term, doesn't matter how many terms there are, we can still cancel out the mass. That's good because we don't know what the value of the mass is here. We turn around and we'd solve for VF here. Let's go through that process since uh, some of you guys have a little bit of trouble rearranging here. Uh, G is 9.81. That is, if we're on the surface of the Earth. Our initial height here is 20 meters. One half of VI squared, that's going to be one half of 10 squared. Don't forget to square the 10, okay, because it's a common mistake. It's a silly mistake. We all know what we're doing there, but still make it. Final height is 9 meters plus one half of VF squared. So let's... Let's do some math here now. Let's say 9.81 times 20. Let's add that to, use some brackets here, 0. 0.5 times 10 squared. Let's subtract from that brackets uh, 9.81 times 9. And then let's uh, divide that by 0.5, or you could have multiplied it by 2, either one. And then let's square root that. Oops. Let's try that again. Okay. 
and we end up getting 17.8 meters per second. How many sig figs should this final answer be? This one should be this one should be two, right? Because of all my data there, 18 meters per second. Good. Good. I hope it's good. Because the odds of you seeing something like this are probably pretty good, right? Let's take a look at the second part of it here, the second question here. I've done quite a bit of this as well. I mean, you know, listen, you're not going to get this and this on the exam, right? Okay, You're going to get one of them. Okay? You're going to get one of these conservation of energy questions. I pretty much told you that. Okay? But you're not going to get, you know, question number six is going to look like this, and question number seven is going to look like this. They're too much alike, right? Be able to do conservation of energy problems, whether we have a spring or whether we don't have a spring. Yeah. Let's set this one up. And we're not going to solve this completely. In fact, we don't even have enough information to solve this completely. You'll see what, what I mean by that in a moment. But that's okay. We'll just set it up here. We say EI is equal to EF. Now, and what kind of energy do I have at the beginning of this problem when it's on the hill on the compressed spring? Okay, I got spring potential energy because it's on a spring that's compressed. If it was on a spring or an elastic that was stretched, it would be the same kind of thing. So we're going to say it's one half of kx squared. Is there anything else as this problem begins here? Not only do we have anything else, any other kind of energy at the beginning of this problem. Good. Because we have a height, we're going to say there's gravitational potential energy, mgh initial. What kind of energy do I have at the end of this problem? Julia, tell me what kind of one kind of energy that I have at the end of the problem. Good, and it's kinetic because it's good. Every time it's moving, it's got kinetic energy. Olivia, is there any other kind of energy at the end of this problem when it's moving but at a height of 20 centimeters? Is it moving? Yes, there's kinetic energy. Is there a spring at the end of the problem? No, so there's no elastic or spring potential. Is there a height? There is. So what kind of energy do we have as a result of a height? It, gravitational potential energy. All right, can I cancel with the mass in this one? Riley, can I cancel with the mass here? Uh, good, because of this one little thing right there, we can't cancel with the mass. Now, that's the reason we can't go through and completely solve this question is because we don't know what the mass is. Yeah, that's okay. We've got it set up here. Um, one thing... One thing that I could have done here, of course, we're solving for VF there, right? One thing that I could have done, uh, and I don't know if any of you guys caught this or not, but I could have set it up slightly different. I could have done this, the same thing for the first question, set it up slightly different. Um, EI is equal to EF. Uh, we have uh, elastic potential energy at the beginning, and we have gravitational potential energy at the beginning, but I could have done this and skipped the gravitational potential energy at the end. What would I have had to do if I skipped the MGH at the end of this problem? Yep. Good. So in other words, in this problem, my initial height is 0.35 meters. My final height is 0.2 meters. In this problem, with the way that I have it set up over here, saying there is no potential at the end, I would have had to say my initial height was 0 0.15 meters, the difference between the two. Because remember what we said about potential, right? We can define our potential energy relative to whatever we want. In the first case, I did it the way most of you will likely do it, and that is relative to the ground. In the second case, I did it relative to the top of the second hill. So it's 15 centimeters above the second hill. I don't care which way you do it. The second way is probably a bit quicker, but most people tend to get a little bit more confused by the second way. So whatever way works for you.